Okay. Thank you for joining us. We'll be broadcasting the session on YouTube and recording. Please consider renaming yourself or keeping your cameras off for privacy. If you have bandwidth challenges, you can watch at our YouTube link, which I posted in the chat. Um, we are here to talk with Milo Stickle Frizzell, uh, aka Ambrosio, about um, text-based video game basics and coding. It's an honor to bring you high quality coping skills and connections and education for Alaskan youth during this pandemic. And we'll be broadcasting this session again on YouTube and recording. Uh, if you have, uh, if we have a couple moments here before introductions, and we had one new person join, thank you. Um, it's an, again, for, for those of you just joining, we will be broadcasting on YouTube, and I have attached the link here in the chat box. To start us off, I would like to begin by recognizing the ancestral indigenous lands on which we are learning and living. I'm Jenny Baker, an employee of the Alaska Division of Public Health, currently living and working on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Dena'ina people yes, who have stewarded this land throughout generations. Please consider introducing yourself in the chat box and acknowledging the land on which you are learning and living today. Okay. This project is made possible by CARES Act funding through the Spirit of Youth and Department of Education and Early Development with generous support from the Alaska State Council on the Arts, Center for Safe Alaskans, Anchorage Youth Development Coalition, the Youth Alliance for Healthy Alaska, and First Alaskans Institute. We'll be using the following features in this webinar today where you can use your cameras on or off, you can use your chat function, and please, um, if you would like to enter your questions in advance or during, that's totally fine, but we'll probably save a majority of the questions for the end unless you need clarification. I encourage you to raise your hand or use the other reactions buttons as we move along for engagement with the speaker. We will be spotlighting the speaker, so they will be the ones that we mostly see during the presentation. For a social norms contract, we encourage you to limit distractions. Um, keeping your video and audio etiquette um, in check, uh, using the chat feature if you have questions, and taking good care of yourself if you need to walk away, mute yourself, turn off your camera, that's totally fine. But we're, we're here to be creative and have fun. Um, please give me a thumbs up um, using the reactions button if you believe in these learning agreements today. Thank you, Lillian. Thanks, Dillo. Thanks, Milo. Perfecto. Um, there's some, lastly, the, la, this last year has been incredibly challenging for many, uh, many of us in every part of how we live, work, learn, and play. We often use art to cope, to heal, and to process what we are feeling. If you need help, uh, please consider checking out these resources on the slide to access your basic needs, mental health services, or crisis intervention. Great. So again, welcome to the Youth Voice, you, the Amplify Youth Voices Alaska Workshop Adventure, text-based video game basics and coding with Milo Stickle Frizzell, aka Ambrosio. And we'll begin with some get to know you polls. I'm gonna stop sharing for just a moment here. And in order to start sharing, we're going to launch our polls here in just one second. You should see your polls pop up. First one is how confident are you with storytelling or story writing? What are what your age is and how much experience do you have with coding? Need to pop up on your screen? Great. One person Waiting for you, Stillwell. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling here in three, two, one. Since there was only one person that submitted results, just share the results. Um, story writing, 
a lot, 50 to 17, and know a little bit about coding. Okay. All right. And in order for us to um, encourage you to participate in the Amplify Youth Voices Alaska project, this is the last thing, but I'll hand, I'll hand it over to Milo here shortly. Um, so we encourage you to participate in the project as much as you possibly can. And this includes um, submitting your art to the DHSS-PIT um, at alaska.gov. We'll be posting all of that on our website, the Amplify Youth Voices Alaska website. Um, if you would please consider submitting those things, uh, that would be great. And those art projects could be used for um, sharing widely throughout the state, um, social media posts. Um, so if you decide to participate, great. You can also post on your own personal social media pages of the art that you've created in conjunction with this project by using our hashtags as listed below. And finally, with long awaited, no, with no more to added to do here, uh, Milo, AKA Ambrosio is a full-time student and artist. He is months away from graduating with his second bachelor's degree from the computer science and engineering program at UAA. Basically he's been in school since forever, as long as I've known him as well, and is looking forward to redefining himself outside of his education this summer. He ran the animation and cartooning club at UAA for two years, volunteers in the community. He loves cooking, especially tacos, which I saw some sort of taco shirt the other day that was like, I love tacos periodically. And it was a taco, T-A-C-O, periodic table. It was pretty funny. Um, and Milo has lived in Alaska half of his life and self-published a di digital comic during the pandemic. You can learn more about his work at ambrosio.com itch.io forward slash and on Twitter at Lil Ambrosio. Without further ado, I will hand it over to Milo. Oh yeah, can you see me? Okay, cool. Can you guys see me? Can I get a thumbs up just to make sure everything's good? Okay, cool. All right, so I'm gonna start um, sharing my screen and begin the presentation. Um, all right, so um, today uh, the presentation is going to be uh, adventure. Um, and so this is going to be focusing primarily on adventure game design. Um, and um, we're going to be learning using a uh, software called Twine. Um, and it's going to be simple text-based games. Um, before we get too far into that, uh, who am I? I'm Miles Stickle Frizzell. I'm an artist and programmer in uh, Alaska. Um, recently, this past year, um, I won the Solstice Fire and Ice Game Jam, which was um, a game competition that was hosted by UI Upscore. Um, and then um, I was also recently featured in the indie game magazine, uh, Indie Apocalypse. It's also like a game bundle. Um, they got released on uh, itch.io, and that just came out um, a couple months ago. So. Um, the Four Stories COVID uh, game, the text-based one that's on Ava's website, I made that. Um, and I'm currently making a much longer, more ambitious game that isn't text-based um, called Death, uh, which is uh, I'm planning on releasing uh, in the next two years on PC and Nintendo Switch. Um, so what is this class about? So this class is about uh, text-based video games. So we're going to be learning some basic design, um, and we're going to be learning some code to go along with it. We're mostly going to be focusing on the code in the software Twine, um, and we're going to teach you how those concepts relate maybe to some other more practical programming languages as well. Um, and to be able to do this, you're going to need a browser uh, and an internet connection. But once you get set up, um, you could do this offline on your computer as well. Um, and hypothetically, you could write out your stories and what you wanted to do on paper and then copy it into a computer later too. So you could possibly do this um, without even having a computer, which is sort of neat. So um, adventure genre, um, that's what we're going to be making today, an adventure game. So this genre is primarily focused on exploration and puzzle solving. Um, and they usually emphasize a story and that's the thrust through the game. Um, so traditionally, they were text-based, and then they moved to 2D and 3D. 
but nowadays they're usually combined with different genres. So you can see on the left here, we've got like Zork and games like Colossal Cave Adventure, which were original text-based games, some of the earliest that you had. And then you have Secret of Monkey Island and other 2D games that were produced um, mostly in the 80s and 90s, which sort of took a lot of those concepts and designs and pushed them forward into more detailed space. Then, you know, talking about um, genre mixing, um, you've got modern titles like Resident Evil, which you could say is like a survival first person shooter, but a lot of the core elements that were developed in old school text adventures from 20, 30 years prior are actually present in those games and make up a big part of the design. Um, so what we're gonna be using today to do this is a software called Twine. So it's a tool that lets you create interactive fiction. Um, it's mostly text-based, but you can put music, images, and other effects in it using um, languages like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So the projects are then played in a browser like Chrome, um, you know, Edge, Firefox, Safari, whatever you have. It's HTML based, so it should work in any browser. Um, and Twine. Okay, so what is that? Um, I ha probably haven't heard of it. So Twine was most popularly used uh, for Depression Quest, which um, is an interactive game about living with depression made by Zoe Quinn. Um, and she was the primary developer. There were a few other people involved, but it's mostly her project. Um, and that made a big splash about 10 years or so ago. Um, and so even though it's just text-based, um, it was actually quite significant because now she's the lead narrative designer on Solar Ash, um, which is the newest game coming from the people who made Hyper Light Drifter. So just because it's text-based doesn't necessarily mean that it is somehow lesser. A lot of the same things apply, and you can still make a splash using a game like that. Another one is um, Temple of Now, um, which I personally like, by uh, Crows, 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 which is the development studio run by William Pugh. Um, you probably don't know who he is. He's um, the guy who co-created the Stanley Parable, and he made this game called Accounting um, with Justin Roiland, the creator of Rick and Morty. So, you know, making text-based games, but also working with the guy who makes Rick and Morty. So somewhat significant. Um, so the first thing that we need to start with, because we're making an adventure game, is the story. And that'll be the thrust of our interactive fiction. So when you're doing that, you need to think about things like, what is your setting? Who are your characters? What is your player's goal? And what kind of story uh, structure you're going to be using to pace out your game? And we're going to talk about um, some examples uh, as we're going along because we're gonna use those to build a story at the end of this presentation. Um, and you don't necessarily have to you know, make your stories in the future just like this, but th these are sort of like templates to go by. Um, so today we are gonna have our setting be like a, a spooky cave on a beach. Um, and so the setting is important because in your game, it's the place you're gonna be spending the most amount of time in. Um, you know, you could end up in an abstract void, but you're you're usually going to have like one main setting, and then you might have sub settings. Um, but most of your interactions are tied to these settings. Um, so, like, let's say you were in a mall, then you could run around and go to all the stores or something, and then you could have like different little stores in there. Um, but you couldn't like ride a roller coaster in the mall unless it was a really cool mall. Maybe they have a roller coaster in there but you're, you're limited by your setting. Um, so Twine's text-based format, one of the things that's really cool about it is that you don't really need to create a lot of assets to do what you wanna do. You can still create basic interactions um, for this world and do what you wanna do in it, but you don't have to make everything. Like if you're making a 2D or a 3D game, you'd have to like draw out the mall um, using either 2D or 3D graphics. And then you'd have to have all these extra interactions. But you don't necessarily have to have that in a text-based setting. So in a way that's sort of like freeing because the bigger and more complicated a game gets visually, um, the less that you're actually able to do. Um, so a lot of text-based games have settings where you can do all manner of things. Um, so characters. Who are you going to play as? Um, are you going to play as more than one person? Are they going to have an arc? Um, so a character arc is basically 
like the main structure of a lot of stories. And it's that a character starts one way and then they become another way by the end, they change. So for our story, the character we're gonna have um, is a treasure hunter. So we can think of him as being like kind of an Indiana Jones type guy. Um, another thing you wanna think about is besides who you're playing as, um, who are you gonna interact with? You're gonna have to write your characters differently. You might have to write in interacting with those characters um, into your code. If you're not just going to have it be written as you talk to the person, you know, maybe you want to pick the dialogue for talking to the person, which is very popular in a lot of role playing games nowadays. Um, so goal, most games and stories have a goal and this forms the natural outline for your game. And so if you can think of a goal that you want to establish, then you can kind of build your story around that and it can make it really easy. So the goal in our story is going to be that our treasure hunter wants to get some treasure. And so you can start out by having the goal set up at the beginning of the story. And then the middle, which will be the majority, is your character working towards that goal. Um, and then your end would be the goal is accomplished. So you, you, once, once that goal gets done, you know, OK, I can be done with my story. This has come to a natural conclusion. Um, and there's other more complicated ways that you can get into this using story structure. Um, so like. A three act structure is most commonly referred to um, in Western culture. And you have a setup, conflict, and a resolution. A variation on this um, is Japanese, Kisho Tenketsu. So you have uh, an introduction, some development up on top of that introduction, a twist, which changes the narrative, and then a conclusion, which resolves that twist. Um, and so you can like write out an outline for a story that hits one of each of these beats and then just kind of connect. Um, those from there. So now we're going to move on to how are we going to actually make this story that we're talking about. So we're going to be using this thing called Twine. And Twine has a story map. And so this is this thing that you can see over here on the left. So this is the story map. And basically what it does is it takes things called passages, which is that little rectangle, and it links them together. And then that's your story. It's like a, a series of passages, essentially. So, and I just mentioned links. So the links are the things that connect passages together, but they can also link to outside sources. Like hypothetically, you could link to a website or something else. Um, then there's clicks, which are things you can do. Um, and that's basically like, if you want the player to be able to interact with something on the screen, um, but you don't want them to get redirected to another passage, then you would use just something like a click. Um, and then variables um, is something that's it's very important, not just in Twine, but in programming in general. And we'll start to get into how this relates to programming and coding in general in a little bit. Um, but variables are like uh, an, a thing that you define as having um, a certain value. So like you could have uh, oranges and or you know how, how many oranges the player has. And so you have a variable called oranges. And oranges is equal to zero. But then the player gets an orange. You know, they, they click on something. We just talked about clicks. They click on something that says get orange. And then you would want to add an orange there so that you could recognize later on how many oranges they have. So then the variable would change to one. Um, they can be a lot of different things, though. They don't just have to be numbers. Um, it could also be like true or false, you know like we're going to do later on, a player is going to get a sword in our story. Um, but if you had not gotten the sword yet, it would be sword is like false or sword is true if you had it. And then you could check like if a person came to get you, can you defend yourself with a sword? Well, sword equals true. And so variables are really important because this relates to um, programming beyond just twine in that like, you could have password uh, protection with a variable. Like um, if the, the, the password does not end up equaling the password that is stored to get into your account, then you wouldn't allow the user to come in. And so a variable would be like the password that you had stored um, to be able to verify that. So then um, the last thing talking about Twine Basics is Harlow. And Harlow is this thing, it's called um, like your story style. 
and there's like a different there's different syntax for how you want to write your story. This isn't really that important though. We're not going to talk about this because um, we're just going to be using the default, which is Harlow. There's some other ones like Sugarcube, um, and if you get really into it, you can change it. But the default is Harlow, and if you look up information about Twine, most people are using Harlow. Um, so moving on. So this is what a passage actually looks like when you get into it. You can see you've got the text at the top. And so that's going to be the title of your passage. And then you've got tags, which is things that you can attach to your passages. Like let's say you wanted um, all of your passages that were tagged red to have red text. Then you could tag it red. And outside of the passages, you could write something that makes it so that passages that are tagged red have red text. Um, so it's a way of like categorizing them basically. And they can have more than one tag. Um, and then you can see like these are all the things that you would have in like a typical word processor, like you know, bold, italic. And then there's even like little um, shortcuts for using some of the things like links and if and input hook, if you forget the syntax. Um, and then on the bottom, the most important part, this is where all of your text is going to go, you know, what your story is and like how it's going to connect to other passages and stuff. So the majority of your writing and your work will be done in that text spot of, um, of the passage. So then linking um, those passages together, um, and we're going to show this later on. So if it seems a little bit overwhelming, um, don't worry, because we're going to do it. And it'll make more sense when we um, when it gets shown. But I'm just going to present it to you so that you know the syntax to begin with. So if you were to make a link to go from a passage, you would have two left brackets. Then you would put whatever the text you want that if you click on, then it redirects to a passage. Then you'd have a bar. And then you'd have the passage you're going to go to, and then two right brackets. So the second part of the text where it says place here, you don't actually see that. That doesn't appear. That's just where it's going. The only text that the person sees when they play your game is the text you want here part. So that first section. Um, and everything else is just in order to tell it what to do. You can also link using a different way. You can have um, a parentheses and then link colon, and then it's got to be in quotes. And then you have your text just like before. Um, but then you put another parentheses, left bracket. And then this next part is where you would put your passage. But in this case, we're using a URL. So this is how you would redirect to a different web page. Um, so you could even use this too. If you, if you didn't want to put images into your story, maybe you just wanted to redirect to them. You could put like, um, you could put an image you find on the internet because, you know, maybe you're not like, I can't get a picture of like a giant robot, but I want a giant robot in my story with a picture. Then you could find a giant robot and you could redirect to that. And then people would be like, oh, okay, that would make more sense. Um, so then clicks, so that's like clicking on a word or something that's on the page and making it do something without redirecting. So um, it's very similar to the URL um, syntax where it's click and then in quotes, then brackets, and then you have asterisks around um, the, uh, the, the next part. But the difference here is that um, the second part, while well, before you wouldn't have seen that, you do see that. That's the part that's going to appear once you click on the first part. Um, so that's like the main difference between links and clicks. Then you've got, uh, let me see if I can move this down a little bit. You've got variables. So um, in Harlow, the way that you would do variables is you have parentheses, set, colon, and then you have to have an exclamation point. I mean, sorry, not exclamation, uh, a dollar sign. And the dollar sign before um, the name is what tells Twine this is a variable. So it always and it always has to happen. Every time you reference it, it has to have it. So like if you if you tried to re refer to it later on, then you would need to put the dollar sign. And you know a lot of programming, even when you're not in Twine, when you're in something more complicated, um, it can be forgetting something as simple as that, and your program doesn't work. You're like, well, why is it that it's not? You know why? Why? Why does the player not have more oranges? And it's like, oh, I didn't put the dollar sign in to say give him an orange. That's why. Um, so basically, how you want to handle variables is, and we'll use um, oranges here for an example. So like set dollar sign oranges to zero because they have zero. And you're going to do that at the beginning of your game, 
And then later on, you can do tests for like, um, you know, if has zero oranges, then they have an option of like dying of scurvy or something because they didn't have enough citrus. Um, and then you can you can change this later on um, by using set again. So like we're gonna do that with the sword where it'll be set sword to zero or false and then set sword to one or true. And then that means you have the sword. And so the reason that I'm using zero and one in this case is because um, in computer science, um, zeros and ones are true and false states. And so sometimes you use them interchangeably with the word true or false, um, but you could also apply this to account. It doesn't necessarily have to be as binary as that. Um, yeah, and so then twine is uh, just a starting point for concepts that we're talking about. Passages are a big thing um, in twine, but they're not gonna be in other languages. Um, you, you've got things called objects, which is main, the main backbone of all major programming languages, is that you have like these containers, which are very similar to passages, um, that hold things, and then they relate to each other. Um, but some things are the same, even though passages aren't present in other languages, you have variables which are the same. And, you know, blocking a player from getting through because they, you know, didn't have a key or allowing them to get through because they um, had enough oranges, you know, that that's sort of similar to uh, if and if else statements, which are things that you'll have in other languages. Um, so some of these are simple, like HTML, CSS, JavaScript. These are things that you can actually use with your Twine story. This is how you would get music and images and other things. So if you worked on this and you liked it, and you wanted to make it better, you could research these. And it wouldn't just be valuable for making your story better. It would also be valuable because it's the basics of web design. You know, you would be able to at least partially make uh, your own web page using what you've learned. Um, but a lot of these other basics also relate to simple languages like Python and Ruby. Um, and you can learn basic progression and narrative design from doing this as well which is useful um, in when you go to design more complicated games. So even if you didn't want to make text-based games, the same philosophy and um, design basics would still apply to a larger game. Like I said, Resident Evil 7 is not a text-based game, but it uses a lot of the same elements of design that older text-based games used. Um, and another thing that uh, this is useful for is building work ethic. You know, just making a story like this, um, you're going to have to do basic problem solving and debugging. Um, and that's good for just having to like work on a project and get it to the point where it works. It's not necessarily like another piece of art where you could be doing a drawing and you could just be like, you know, that's done. And no one could tell you objectively that it's not done. But when you're making something like this, um, it could, there, there's an objective stopping point where um, it functionally works. And before that point, um, you just haven't debugged it enough. And so you have to kind of work to make sure you get to that point. Um, and that can be useful for doing other things as well um, outside of programming. Um, okay, so now we're gonna try and actually make uh, one of these stories. So what you wanna do is go to the uh, link right here. We're going to drop it in the chat. Um, and don't do this now, but afterwards, you can also download a desktop version of this app. And then you could have it offline um, and just use it you know, without having to be logged into a browser. And that's typically what I have done when I've used this. Um, but we're just going to work in the browser for today. Okay, so I'll just wait for um, 
everybody to get to a point where they're at this screen. You won't have this right here. You might have something that says template, but just get to this screen um, and then give me like a thumbs up on the on the chat for reaction, and then we can we can keep going. I dropped it in the chat to start, but I had a coding error and I forgot two forward slashes. So oh. <laughs> there might be a little bit of delay. Well, do you need me to put it back in there? Do I, uh... That's good. I think I got okay. it. Yeah. I think I got that black box out of the way now because I'm not in full screen. OK. I'm going to start. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to click Create Story. So what should the story be named? Um, you can say Pirate's Cave. And hey, now look, we're at that, um, that page that I was talking about before, the story map. That's what this is called, where um, you have passages. And you can see this right here is our starting passage, and it's got a little green rocket ship guy. So that means that you're going to start there. And you can change where you're starting from later on. Um, but for now, it just defaults to this. Um, OK, so if we click on here, um, then you can see we've got, first thing, we want to name our passage. And so because we're outside of the cave that we talked about earlier, we're just going to call this outside. And I'm going to copy some text in here from the story that I've written before. And then I'll help you with the coding part. Um, so you would just write this in like you were writing in any regular story. Um, and it will just show up um, as white text on a black screen. Um, and you can format this a gajillion different ways. You know, you could make this really stylized and try and um, make it look like not even not even close to like a book, but like people have done some really experimental stuff where there's like motion graphics of this too. So it doesn't have to just look like this, but in the most basic form, it'll just be text. Um, and then what we're going to do is um, we're going to add our first link. So two left brackets, we're going to fill in here, reading it. And then we've got a bar. And the next passage, we're going to call note. And that's all that you need to do for there. And then there's some other stuff I'm going to do here, too. I'm going to set some variables that will be useful from later, for later. And so that's one of the things that I always do with the story is that I set up those variables right at the beginning. And so it's parentheses, set, colon, got to have the dollar sign and then the name of the variable and whatever it's going to be. Um, Are the spaces essential between the colon and the dollar sign? And after I don't, the... I don't think so. I think you could, yeah. It, 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 it the, the, you can, you can have more spaces too, I think, and it still works. Um, it's not too picky about formatting. If you, if you use other programming languages, like if you were to use like Python or something, um, that's called namespace. Uh, like the white space between um, characters and like functions that you're using. And so then it becomes important. So depending on what you're doing, it can be important, but in Twine, it's not um, just food for thought for the future. So we, we put note in there um, as a link to a passage and we hadn't even made it yet, but Twine automatically makes it. So we get another passage here and this brings us to note. And so now we have this one. So I copy in the next text, and we'll put in another link. Go into the cave now. OK, so now we've got cave two. So now let's try something. We can see what this looks like. If I click play right here, it's this button, then it'll bring up the story. And you can see, this is what I was talking about, about black screen, white text. And then you've got your link here, which will take us to the next passage. 
And when you're playing this inside of um, Twine itself, um, when you when you do this, it'll give you this little screen here. And so this is going to be where your variables are, and this will help you to do debugging. So if something wasn't working, like we said, oh well, you know, I I thought he had the keys. Why isn't the door opening and you can check here and see, oh, well, I guess my code for the keys wasn't right because it hasn't changed to be one. So that must mean he doesn't have the keys. So then I can go check that. So you can use this debugging menu to see if something isn't working um, in your variables. Um, but if we click here, now this redirects us to our next page. And so by default, you get this little arrow here in Twine, and that lets you go backwards and forwards, um, kind of like if you were in a book. But you don't have to have this. You can add in code to get rid of this um, if you didn't want it to be there and you wanted it to be more like a traditional adventure game. And I usually remove this arrow. Um, but we, we have it by default, and we have it here right now. So then if we go into our cave, this is where things get a little bit more complicated. So I'll copy in my text. And now this is when we start to need variables. So um, right here on this last, um, this last piece of text, I say, to your left is a wall and a door that looked like they were built from an old wooden ship. Um, and so there is a sword that is going to be stuck into a note here. But you can also take the sword. So you need the text to change after you take the sword so that it's not sticking in there. So what you do is you write um, an if statement checking your variable. And so um, right here we can do if, and then colon. We're going to do sword is 0, because it's, it's 0. Oh, a little bit of typo there. If sword is zero, um, which it is right now because we set it to be at the beginning, then it's going to write this. I'll just copy it in there. But if we have the sword, then it, then it should write something else. So in that case, we put else colon and then in the brackets, we put the text. Um, and so this is like the most basic thing for progressing through a story. So I'm going to copy something else right below here um, that does the same thing, but in a different way. So right here, you know, this is seeing if the player has keys. And if they have the key to the door, then they can use it and they can open the door. But if they don't, then it's going to take them to the passage locked door. And so they'll just have to come back here and go look somewhere else. And so you can make a whole game um, you know, very elaborate just using a, you know, a basic set of variables and these if-else statements. You could do a whole one. Um, you wouldn't need anything else. Um, and um, you could just change, like you could be looking for keys, or you know, maybe you need a certain amount of things. Um, and if your story is interesting enough, you could probably entertain the player throughout all of it. And you, you know, you could probably add in images and effects. And some of the stories that I mentioned earlier, um, they actually do this, or they're not really that complicated, and they just kind of are using if else and variables. Um, so then, right here, we've got some other things. These are just options that you can have for this room. So it starts to get a lot more complicated. It doesn't have to be so linear, where you have like a list of options that you could have. You could have like 100 options, hypothetically, um, you know, in one room. But you would have to write all of the different connections to passages and the way the code works. So like right here, here's another one of those if statements I was talking about. You know, if you don't have the sword, then you can take the sword. Um, and if dead, ooh, dead, that's kind of spooky there. Um, well, if something's dead, then you can't crawl through the hole. But if something isn't dead, then you can crawl the through the hole. Um, but if you look here, see now it's made all of these different 
passages that you can go to um, in your story map, it starts to get really complicated really quickly. And so it's important to kind of come back here and reorganize it a bit so that you don't get lost. Because once your story starts to get longer, then you get really confused. Um, and so like the story, the COVID story that I made, you know, it's got like 100 of these. And so if I didn't organize them, I wouldn't really be able to tell the difference very much. Um, but you can also you can also zoom out too. You push the minus button and you can see it from further back. And sometimes just seeing the physical structure of the story and the game can help you to figure out things that you should change or, you know, oh, maybe this should be longer or this should be shorter or this is too complicated. Um, but a good part of uh, adventure game design, I would say, is creating a central area. And so in this case, this is this cave that then connects to other areas and you need to get to a new area. So in this case, we need to get through this door, but we can't yet because we don't have keys. So then we go check our other options to see if we can find something that gives us keys, get the keys and we come back. And so even though it's not literally keys, a lot of adventure game design um, and one could argue game design in general is just um, gatekeeping. It's just, you need a key to get through, go find the key. And it could be anything, you know, you could be playing a shooting game and you got to like um, shoot 10 aliens or something to be able to go through. And so in that case, the keys are shooting the 10 dudes, but it's really just um, the same philosophy where you need to get something to be able to get through the door. Um, so we're going to skip to further on one second. Okay, so this is the, um, the desktop app. Can you see all good? Okay, this is the desktop app for Twine. And you can see here is this completed story. Um, and um, it's got kind of like a certain shape to it. And I've tried to keep it so that it's organized where like you have a game over screen that you can redirect to if a player dies right here. Um, and so like a lot of different things can connect to that. And then you'd want to bring it back to the beginning of your story so that they could play again, hypothetically. Um, and then the cave connects to all these things and passages will need to connect back to each other. So, you know, if you go somewhere, you'll be able to want, you'll, you'll want to be able to come back. So sometimes you'll have to be like, oh yeah, that's right. I need to connect this passage back to the passage I came from. It doesn't go two ways. So if we look at cave here, it says read the message. And then we want to read the message. If we go to message, then we got to connect back to cave. Otherwise, they're just stuck there. Um, and so that's something sometimes when you're designing, um, not just text-based games, but in general, you know, you'll you'll be playtesting and going through a level or a story, and then all of a sudden you can't go any further and you're like, oh. Well, this doesn't work. And so you'll have to go back and, you know, fix up. And a lot of that will be um, just playing it over and over again and seeing, okay, this works, this doesn't work, this is a dead end, this isn't a dead end. Because when it gets really complicated and you have all of these different things that are connecting, even though it's just text based, um, it can be easy to forget, you know, just a small thing, one single line, um, especially when your passages get to be long and have all of these different things that they need to do right in them. Um, so we can play this story. Um, if we go here, so we're going into the cave. Now you can see this is the stuff I was talking about where you can like try to open the door. So we don't have keys. So it goes to a locked door. So we need to go back, look for keys, you can take the sword. Now the thing with the sword doesn't show up there anymore because we had that statement that was like, if sword equals zero, this shows up. But sword equals one now because we have it. And you can see it right here in this little section where it says here. So now we know it's working because this debugger is like, yep, that's right. Um, 
But like I said, you know, this is just a whole story that you can make using those if else's and those variables. Um, and well, we can we can die really quick. So you can get a game over screen. You just go to a passage and then try again. You bring yourself back to the beginning. And that's another reason that it's important. You can see that the variable sort is zero now. We set the variables at the beginning because if you were to have a game over and you were to restart, you would want everything to be reset. Um, and th this uh, is another thing that applies to game design in general beyond just text-based, that you got to reset everything um, on the game side when you're programming so that um, the player doesn't have some sort of unforeseen problem, like they have a sword too early or you know they have too many of a thing, and then it could even cause your game to crash, possibly, um, if like a certain scene um, not in Twine, but in, in a game engine wasn't supposed to happen too early. It could it could break it. Twine's simple enough that, you know, if you had a variable be like sword equals one, it would probably only ruin your story and not break your whole computer. So, um, but those are the basics of making a story. We're going to make this story available to you and um, you can edit it and change it. You could, you know, maybe you're not super confident in, um, the programming stuff that we talked about, like the links and the clicks and the variables. Um, so maybe you can just change the text to start with, and then you can get more confident and you can um, try it on your own and learn some more things um, like adding music or images, yada, yada. Um, and Jenny, I think we were going to do, yeah, if there, there are any questions or yeah. do you guys, um, those of you on the call so far have any questions about gaming or about the text-based stuff or anything like that, that would be helpful. Okay. I don't have a question regarding this, but I was wondering, Milo, when did you start coding or like, when did you find that you're interested in it? Um, well, in high school, I would say I started getting more interested in software, but I didn't take it very seriously. And I would say that I wish I had um, because I didn't realize how valuable it was, not just for being able to make things that I wanted but to be able to, um, like, career-wise, I, I didn't realize how, like, oh, this is something that people actually would pay you to do. Um, so I, I started in high school, but not seriously. I would say I started more seriously in freshman year of college. I was, like, 18 or 19, um, and I just took a starter class. So, like, if you get interested in programming, um, you, you can – have a pretty uh, low risk option um, by taking a starter class at a college university. Um, because from what I've seen, most computer science programs have a class specifically designed for people who are just like, is this for me? Um, and so you can just try it. It's basically the try programming class. Like you don't have to be like, I'm going to commit to a degree or I'm going to commit to, you know, a minor or like learning a bunch. You just commit to one class. Um, and it's just supposed to be like, uh, like a taste test. And UAA actually has one of those um, that is newer now where they teach Python. Um, I haven't looked at the class recently, but I know that the faculty were talking about it. They, they didn't always have it. They actually added it in. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, what other forms of artwork influence your text-based game development? Um, so I play a lot of games, so that helps. Um, and not all the games I make are text-based, but I would say like the adventure games I listed, um, like, you know, Resident Evil, Secret of Monkey Island, uh, Zork, like I, the, looking at the design of those has definitely influenced things that I'm making now. Um, and um, even when I've moved out of text-based, because some of my games aren't text-based, um, they, uh, they still are, have, have proven to be valuable to me. 
and being able to look back and reference like, oh, what did you know? What did so-and-so do? And I like pull up the game like Sork or something and like look at the way that they progressed from one area to the next. And then I can kind of like code up a solution that's similar to that and see if it works for what I'm doing. So. Awesome. Um, one of the things that we were talking about was just maybe not knowing the direction that you're going to go um, when you start school and then you start like you'd started with art and so and then moving in the direction of computer sciences and so like what's your perceived value of computer science and engineering um, education? Um, so one of the reasons that I wanted to uh, teach this class when I was given the opportunity to um, and put out this video for people to see after if they're watching it right now um, is that uh, computer science is really useful for problem solving. Um, and I would say that that's probably the biggest thing about it is that people probably think that it's like you go to someone who's a computer scientist and they help you with your Microsoft Word processor. That isn't necessarily what it's about. It's more like theory and figuring out solutions. Um, you know, it's an engineering field, just like civil engineering or um, like electrical engineering. And there's actually a lot of overlap in computer science and electrical engineering, especially at the University of Alaska, where they make you take electrical engineering classes. So I'd say the problem solving is like very important. And there are people that I've worked with, um, you know, as a student um, who are currently working in the computer science industry and they've been hired for jobs that aren't computer science oriented because of their degree, because the employers that hired them thought that it was valuable because they had problem solving skills. Um, so, you know, it teaches you to try and figure out, just like we're talking about seeing if the variable, like, you know, what's wrong? Why, why isn't, you know, getting the sword working? Well, that's a problem. And then you have to like figure out the solution on your own. There's no, you know, Nobody's just going to tell you the solution. You have to figure out the solution on your own and get the software to work. So, and you could apply that to something that isn't software. Perfect. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so how do you think, uh, well, actually, let me pop back to our participants. Any other questions from you all before I ask another question? Do you know a lot of people who got into coding in college? Um, yeah, I would say yes. It's not, it's not something you have to, I, I know plenty of people who got into coding in college who aren't even like young. There are people who are in my degree program who are like 40 or 50 who went back to learn how to code. So never too late to learn to code. Um, but yeah, no, there are plenty of people that, that just started with the program and maybe they should have done some research beforehand but they ended up being fine. So, you know, it's, they, they, depending on, if you have a good program, then, then you will, you will be able to go in not knowing anything and come out fine. Um, yeah. You, or even if you teach yourself, you know, there are people who have jobs in computer science that they don't ever go to school. You have to learn a lot to do that. Um, but if possible. Awesome. Um, so you've, you've gone from arts to computer science. Um, so how do you plan or how do you envision applying your education into your future? Um, so like I said, I'm currently making a much bigger game and it has art and music uh, and animation. It's got 2D animation and, you know, um, different types of game design. And because it's more complicated, um, it needs more complicated programming. So um, I'm working on that right now. Uh, I'm planning on submitting that to a couple festivals once it's finished. Um, the IGF has a student festival, I mean, a, a student game award at their festival. So um, probably going to send it to that, I don't know, maybe Indicate or something. But uh, I'll be doing that. And then computer science as a career as well, software engineering. So Awesome. I, it's so cool to see, because I just have known you for so long, to see you like really define what you want for yourself and use your education. And you're still being super creative with all that you've um, learned. So I just really wanted to thank you for your time and um, joining us today. Um, I'm going to have a couple more closing slides. If Does anyone have any other questions while I get to those couple closing slides?
Okay. Well, um, if you liked what you saw here today, there will be more to come, more uh, workshops. Um, anyone from uh, any sorts of arts design like um, um, dance and creative writing and painting and a couple other um, Alaska Native uh, culture crafts will be showcased on our website. Um, and we have uh, a couple really great workshops um, posted there too. So we encourage you to pop onto our website and register for new um, upcoming classes. We also encourage you again to submit your art. So if you have art to share, please do email dhss-pit at alaska.gov. Um, and if you have something that you want to share that's over 20 megabytes, um, we can work with you on that and request a download link. Um, obviously there's some rules around what we share. Um, so anything with illegal activity, nudity, hate speech, et cetera, we won't be posting those online. Um, but submissions may be used and shared and replicated through our social media posts, newsletters, et cetera. Um, and we'll be um, enlisted in perpetuity on YouTube, on our Amplify Youth Voices Alaska um, playlist. And we encourage you just to continue um, seeking um, supports over this time. We know that's a really challenging time in everyone's life. So make sure to um, know that you have access to the Alaska Care Line, um, which is that 877-266-4357. Um, or there's some uh, emergency mental health counseling um, at some numbers listed here on the screen, um, as we'd mentioned before. Um, just to say, you know, in gratitude, thank you again, Milo Ambrosio, um, for your time. Um, you can, uh, everyone, find a list of our future presenters on our website, which is a story maps as well, artgis.com um, website, and I'll go ahead and drop that in the chat. Um, and I'll also drop in the chat our next, um, or our, the registration link for our next um, workshops. So thank you everybody and um, hope you have an epic rest of your day and stay safe and healthy everyone.